council election in September. So uh, this section will uh, focus on uh, the analysis of the upcoming uh, legislative council election. Um, and this election is, I think, significant in, in certain senses. Um, well, first of all, in our first section, we talk about how the chief uh, executive election has revealed, you know, a um, very serious split within the pro-establishment camp. So I guess one crucial question that we would like to, you know, um, try to understand is, you know, how is this split going to affect the upcoming uh, election, uh, legislative council elections, especially, you know, the functional constituency uh, elections, um, as well as the fate of uh, the, the, the Liberal Party. Uh, the second question, I think, is about the Democratic camp, of course, that is you know, a very important issue, is how are they going to uh, perform in this upcoming election, uh, whether they can maintain their position as the pivotal uh, minority um, in, in the Legislative Council. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, this uh, September, we're going to have uh, five new uh, functional constituency seats uh, for the, for the so-called uh, super seats uh, coming out of uh, the um, uh, the district council, the new district council functional constituency. Um, then the question of course is, you know, how are the political parties preparing for this, and you know, what would be the um, the, the condition be like? Uh, and finally, of course, is, is the possible aftermath of the election, um, about possible change in political alignment, as well as uh, any implications uh, for um, the executive legislative relationship. So with this, we have our four speakers today are firstly, uh, Professor Anthony Zhang, who is uh, the president of the Hong Kong Institute of Education and a member of the Executive Council. Uh, Professor Zhang was also uh, a Legislative Council member from 1995 to uh, 1997. Uh, our uh, second speaker is uh, Mr. Horace Zhang, who is a vice chairman of the Democratic Alliance for the Betterment and Program. The Betterment and Progress of Hong Kong. Uh, he's also a member of the Henan Provincial Committee of the CPPCC, a me committee member of the China Youth Federation, and also a disciplinary panel member under the Professional Accountants Ordinance. Um, our third speaker, uh, Professor, our third speaker, uh, Professor Michael De Golia, uh, is a professor of uh, Government and International Studies. Um, uh, of uh, Baptist University, uh, and he also uh, is the director of the very well-known uh, Hong Kong Transition Project, and he has authored, you know, a hundred and over hundred and eighty research papers and commissioned reports, and with new, numerous other publications. Um, so he is actually, um, I would say, a very well-known and, and um, um, senior um, political scientist, you know, uh, focusing on uh, Hong Kong politics as well as, um, you know. Um, Opinion polls. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Professor Joseph Chang, uh, who is the professor uh, of political science uh, at the Department of uh, Public and Social, uh, sorry, Public and Social Administration of the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, professor Chang was also a full-time member of the Central <coughs> Policy Unit in 1991 and 1992. Uh, he was also uh, the former Secretary General of the Civic Party. So without further ado, may I first invite uh, Professor uh, Anthony Zhang to uh, deliver his speech. Thank you very much, Eliza. Uh, at the earlier session, before the break, uh, Alan Lee said uh, ex-co non-official members are just puppets. Uh, I wouldn't comment on that because of the uh, confidentiality. <laughs> Uh, but I noticed that uh, during the CE campaign, actually, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I should mention the name of the candidate, but somehow candidates describe EXCO non-official members as commentators, as really commentators. Uh, but uh, I suppose, uh, I, uh, of course here I'm trying to play the role of a commentator, but because of my EXCO hat, I cannot comment as freely as commentators like Alan Lee or others. Um, the topic itself, uh, to me, uh, I'm, I'm not in the best position to say too much about the implications of the forthcoming electrical election because I'm not belonging to any party contesting in the election. Obviously, we can make some predictions, uh, but I, uh, I, I would do that 
uh, later on. But I think probably the, 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 the dynamics of the coming electrical election campaign or the, in, the, 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 uh, the possible outcomes might be best uh, 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 talked about by the other speakers here, some of them coming from parties. To me, I think um, um, the forthcoming electrical election, in a way, is another electrical election. It's more of the same in terms of the general um, uh, configuration of the uh, LegCo as it is evolving. But what would be uh, closely watched, watched at, I think, uh, might be a few aspects. First, we have experienced over the last few years uh, rather serious um, fragmentation, if you like, within both the democratic camp and the um, so-called establishment camp. And then in the recent uh, C election, there is the observation that there is a serious split within the uh, so-called establishment camp. So it will be interesting to see how these uh, splits or fragmentations might be played out uh, within the election. And particularly, uh, I suppose um, in the geographical elections, then because of the operation of proportional representation, actually the mechanism facilitates or sometimes even encourages uh, that kind of fragmentation in, into different tickets. So you will see among the pan-democrats perhaps rather fierce competition among different groups. And it will be interesting in that regard to see how the uh, controversy about the uh, so-called referendum vote back in 2010 might be uh, 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 might be turned as an issue because obviously among the pan democrats you have those who are who were not in favor of that referendum and those who fought for that referendum and then people said after the that vote after the democratic party had voted in favor of a compromise with the government on constitutional reform two years ago and then the the, the, the referendum camp <coughs> said they would revenge in the next election. So we will see how the voters will react to that, what the voters will be um, uh, casting the judgment. And similarly, uh, among the uh, pro-establishment uh, groups, uh, there are different views. And I think there is a further dimension in the coming election, and that is the um, uh, cliffage between grassroots, grassroots interests and the so-called business interests. And this is also an issue in the C election as well, between the two, the two camps, uh, the Tan camp and the, and the Leung camp. So I think the, these will provide rather uh, useful pointers to future uh, politics in Hong Kong, at least at the uh, more general election level, because at the moment we only have general election for geographical seats uh, of electrical. The other um, um, aspect which I think should be uh, 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 looked at is whether the new chief executive, Siva Leung, whether he will be a target in this election. Um, uh, and that will provide some hints as to the next five years, uh, his government's interaction with Lechko. Now, the outcome of the election uh, might be critical, I think, uh, to some. In two, in two senses. First, whether the pan democrats will still be able to retain the so called one third critical minority within the electoral. That was the point uh, alluded to by Dr. Ray Yip in the previous session. Because to the, dem the pan democrats, that would be very important in terms of giving them a veto over any constitution reform uh, packages to be proposed by the new government, whether for uh, the electrical composition in 2016 or the C election in 2017. Now the other uh, thing is whether as a result of this coming electrical election, within the electrical, there would be uh, a, a big enough uh, coalition, so to speak, that the new chief executive can work with so as to uh, facilitate uh, a kind of uh, executive-legislative relationship that, that, uh, that is uh, 
uh, conducive to effective uh, governance by, by the new administration. Of course, over the last few years, there has been a lot of suggestions that uh, somehow the electrical as a whole doesn't see eye to eye with the executive. So whether or not this coming election may generate a result that can um, provide new points of departure. Now, I, I'm not advocating any optimistic or pessimistic view. I'm just pointing out to uh, uh, the, the aspect that we could pay some attention to. Having said that, I would like to um, uh, say something about the, the, the big C. Uh, if I may say so, the electrical has been a very important uh, element in shaping Hong Kong politics over the last two decades, from the early 1990s onwards, uh, since the introduction of uh, the direct election uh, in the geographical constituency in some of these well, in geographic constituencies in Lechco in 1991. And you can, we have seen how Lechco uh, has become uh, more responsive to public participation, to public demands. We have seen how Lechco uh, has achieved its separation from the executive, from the previous fused model uh, up until the 1980s. We have seen how Lechco effectively has rewritten the rule of politics in Hong Kong. The, the policy panels in Lechco, the PNP, the Privileges and Powers Ordinance, which gives Lechco the, the right to hold inquiries, high profile investigations into government matters. We have seen um, uh, the Bills Committee becoming more interesting, at least than before. And um, we have seen Lechco members uh, emerging as uh, um, a focused foci of attention in political terms. So, 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 so these are all very uh, important developments in Hong Kong. And the question time, not just for the chief executive, but also for other government officials, has become uh, a, a very important opportunity for legislators to display their political skills, how they would hold the government to account, and also at the same time, it gives an opportunity, a platform for government officials to, to display their individual leadership or their individual political capacity, how they respond to challenges. Now, so far up to this stage, uh, I think Lechko has been the key, the dominant shaper, of maker and shaper of local politics within a rather constrained sense uh, under the basic but I personally would uh, make two predictions, like Joseph Lam did in the previous section. The first prediction uh, is, maybe from uh, now on, Lechko will not be the dominant shaper and maker of politics. Because we are facing um, uh, the, the chief executive election by universal suffrage in 2017. Now, if that target is really to be achieved, then I will see that the CE election, in a way, would have some reverse effect on the development of the dynamics of the electoral. Of course, um, there are still views, suspicions, uh, pessimism about 2017. Joseph Lang earlier said that, well, it's not guaranteed. That, and, 2017 will only happen, I mean, the, the, the C election by universal suffrage will only take place if there is general agreement. What if there is no general agreement? Would that mean we'll come back to 2012, the, the, the method that we are now adopting? Now, that theoretically is a possibility. Constitutionally, it's a possibility because the MPC Standing Committee resolution in December 2007 only said that. Well, that is the earliest time for universal suffrage to take place. But if we use the kind of big picture scenario adopted by Joseph, I think Joseph is not here now, because he all along has alluded to the dominant position or the, the influence of Beijing, the, the CCP, the Communist Party. Now, if we look at that within the, the, the construct of the, uh, how the Communist Party will direct, will, will, will influence developments, 
then I would tend to believe that 2017 will be a real timetable. And in terms of um, uh, local reaction, in terms of international attention, if 2017 doesn't turn out, in other words, we don't have the kind of election of CE by universal suffrage in 2017, I think that will be a great uh, backlash. Uh, the, the, the credibility of the central government will be in, uh, at risk. And then you have this total sort of uproar in Hong Kong. So I think the, the mission, uh, I'm not a party to what's going on in Beijing, but I think as a political observer in Hong Kong, I would still tend to believe that 2017 will be on. Then the next question is, what will be the nomination mechanism like? Now in the discussion about 2012, the, the current government has uh, more or less suggested that the existing uh, election committee, the 1200 people election committee, the way it is formed, these can form the basis of the constitution of the future nomination committee because the basic law requires that there should be a nomination committee which is representative enough and that nomination committee should then take care of the nomination of candidates. Now one uh, very seamless kind of seamless transition to 2017 would be that the current 1200 member election committee will be turned into a nomination committee with suitable modifications because of the changing circumstances so essentially formed on the same basis. Now that will achieve several purposes. First, simple to understand because it's an extension of the current arrangement. Secondly, it will ensure that the pandemic press will be able to fill a candidate. Now, I've always, as, as an individual person, I'm not speaking on behalf of government or the exco for that matter, I've always advocated that a defining feature of what, of whether the 2017 C election is democratic or uh, a, a, a true election is whether the Democrats can take part. Now, the, if we use the current uh, uh, election committee composition, that will guarantee the Democrats will be able to get the necessary nominations. And if we use the current um, um, method of each candidate getting at least one eighth of the uh, nominations uh, of the, uh, nominations from uh, what uh, nominations from one eighth of the membership of the election committee. We are talking about, about 150 votes, 150 nominations. So similarly, if we say in 2017 you have uh, 150 as the minimum, the Democrats can be nominated, and in theory, at the most, you have up to eight. In reality, you don't have eight candidates. So, so that would be a, a, a kind of transition that would be that would create less hurdles. But I would believe that once Hong Kong is able to transit to uh, uh, what people would accept as a real, a genuine uh, direct election of the chief executive, then the chief executive in turn will drive local, uh, the development of local politics in Hong Kong. Of course, the LegCo still has a very important role, but then the, 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 the political theater will not be lopsided. At the moment, it's all centered on LegCo. Now, if that is likely to be a scenario, then what might the current chief, the, the new chief executive do? I mean, see my level. If he, he has said on record that he's hoping that he would get this baptism of universal suffrage in 2017, so the way he prepares for 2017 as a genuine uh, direct election, I think that will also affect how inter he interacts with uh, the electrical and how he also, on his part, try to redefine the rules of politics in Hong Kong. So I think that will make Hong Kong's political scene very interesting. The second prediction is that I would expect the democratization process in Hong Kong to be increasingly uh, led by Beijing. The whole reason being that uh, after the handover in 1997, somehow within Hong Kong, 
it has been so difficult or almost impossible to arrive at a cross-party consensus on how to move forward. Because under the basic law, if there is a two-thirds majority, then Hong Kong can decide how to do uh, in terms of constitutional reform uh, um, uh, uh, at the next stage. But somehow, there was such, no such consensus. People might blame Beijing for not being clear enough. And Beijing might argue, well, you don't have a consensus. Now, but if the reality really is, there's no consensus. In other words, while the Democrats can get the one-third, make critical minority, but the Democrats are unable to reach any strategic compromise with the other forces on the go. That, in reality, will say, we mean that unless Beijing is prepared to say, well, oh, this is the, the package that Beijing would like to, to see, otherwise there will be no consensus. Now, this is how things have turned out in 2010. So if that really is the scenario, then you will expect the central government uh, from now onwards will be, in a way, leading the process of democratization in Hong Kong. So 2017, 2020 would be interesting in terms of how we might, we might um, expect uh, Beijing to, to come up with. Uh, so I, I, uh, I just want to outline the, the, the broader picture so that we can see the forthcoming military election perhaps within this uh, uh, with, uh, be part of the growing uh, big picture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. And I'd like to pass the time to uh, Mr. Horace Chen. Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I need to point out that I'm not a distinguished speaker here because as, as you can see, the other three speakers, they are all professors. <laughs> and, and I'm just a, a member of a political party in Hong Kong. Um, I, I entirely agree with Professor Chen that uh, uh, Actually, uh, we, we cannot say today we, uh, we can have some uh, comment on the implication of the upcoming national election because it, it hasn't uh, happened uh, up to date. But uh, I can share with you about um, uh, my, point, uh, my prediction from the practical point of view uh, about the coming uh, logical election, especially from the point of view of a pro-establishment party um, if you know the history about the uh, electrical election in Hong Kong, you may know that um, in the past electrical election, um, FTU and DAB, they will come together to win the election, and the DAB member will be the, uh, uh, the, the candidate in the electrical election, and the FTU will, uh, uh, as a battle force, to support the DAB member. But in the coming uh, electrical election, you can see that uh, FTU will become an independent uh, power to have their own list uh, of uh, members to run the electrical election. Uh, I think that one of the reasons that you can see from the uh, pandemic, grid, recently there is a new uh, Labour Party so um, after you, they come out to become a uh, very key uh, position uh, on the protection of labor interests. So in the coming national election, uh, you can see in almost each uh, geogra uh, geographical uh, election, the FTU will have their own members their own list, and they will have their own list. And th there may be some intensive, uh, intense uh, competition even between DAB and FTU. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, uh, on the Hong Kong Island, you can see that we will uh, have two tickets, uh, two lists, uh, and the FTU will have their one list. And up to date, there's still no compromise between the three lists. So you, you can expect that uh, there may be some overlapping uh, of the, uh, 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 the support. And it may be very difficult for DAB and FTU to calculate the number of votes uh, in the coming electrical election. And it is a challenge to DAB and FTU in this coming election. 
Um, so in the coming election, if FTU they become a, an independent NIST, um, certainly they will focus on the protection of labor interests. Um, so you can expect that DAB, their, their position uh, in terms of social policies, they may, I can say there may be a, some room for us to move to the central in terms of social policy. Uh, for example, uh, on the policy of the minimum wages. Um, because in the past, DAB, when we uh, uh, decide our, uh, uh, our nine about the policy, we need to concern about the opinion of the FTU. And they certainly, they strongly uh, uh, focus on the protection of labor interests because they have strong competition from the uh, pandemic group, from the Labour Party. So if in the logical, com uh, logical election we, we come from different lists, uh, it may be, uh, I can say DAB may be feasible to move to the central uh, on the spectrum. And the other, uh, another uh, prediction is that uh, you can see from the upcoming national election, uh, especially for the bigger party, I mean DAB and uh, Democratic Party, uh, they will have more than one list in each geographical election. Uh, DAB learned a lesson from the last election. Uh, for example, in the uh, little territories of East, uh, four years ago, uh, we get uh, more than 100,000 votes, but we only get three, uh, two seats. But for the Democratic Party, they, uh, they got less than 100,000 votes, but they, they got three seats. <laughs> yeah, so actually we, we learned, uh, I can say we learned a lesson from that because in the, uh, the present system is that it's a proportional so, uh, if you want all the candidates in one list, you must get much more votes. So you can see from uh, the upcoming uh, logical election that uh, on the Hong Kong Island side, we will have two lists. Uh, the Liu Territory West will have three lists. And Liu Territory uh, East will have two lists. We try to get uh, much more seats. Uh, uh, I can say, uh, because even though you, you get limited votes, uh, but we, we try to get as much votes as uh, by, by such kind of tactics. And under the present proportional system, for the, I say for the bigger party, you will uh, try to win the election by uh, more than one list. But for this, actually under the present system, uh, for the smaller party, uh, I mean LSD and the People's Power, uh, they can, I, I would say that they can still survive under the present system because under the present system even they only got, uh, get uh, the support of less than 10% minority uh, of the people in Hong Kong but they can still uh, get the benefit to get the seat under the present system so I would say after the electoral election Hong Kong will still maintain the multi-party systems in Hong Kong and uh, the smaller party, they can still survive. Uh, I would say unless uh, there will be a uh, substantial change of the election system, uh, the, smaller uh, the smaller party can still survive. And Another prediction is about uh, the, in, the prediction of the super seat uh, because uh, it's a little uh, element in the logical election. And I can say almost a uh, low party in Hong Kong has experience about how to win the super seat campaign in Hong Kong. Um, to DAB, actually it's a good op uh, opportunity for us to, to learn experience uh, about how to run a universal suffrage, especially for the uh, election of a chief executive uh, in the coming 2017. Be uh, 
Uh, in the past, we, we only uh, learned the experience to one, the geographic election, um, but we haven't got any experience to, to one, the uh, whole Hong, I can say the uh, election of, uh, by the, all the Hong Kong people all together. Uh, but by the, this super election, we can nominate one candidate. And if this candidate need to get the support from all the Hong Kong, the, all, all the people of Hong Kong, um, so it's a good uh, opportunity for us to try to combine um, the election with the geographic election. We know how to work the geographic election, but how to uh, put together the candidates of the super city and the geographic election together and under the support of the, of the candidate of the geographic election, we can, I can say, sell, sell the candidate uh, of the super seat. Uh, we haven't done that before, uh, but to us, it's, it's, we uh, expect that it's similar to the uh, chief executive election under universal suffrage because you have one candidate, you have to get the support from all the people of Hong Kong, so you need to motivate uh, uh, our district council member, all the, all the district council members to support uh, one candidate in one election. So uh, I think after the uh, election of, of the super seat, we can, uh, uh, actually we can uh, try to uh, conclude our experience. And I think it will be a very good lesson for us to how to support uh, the uh, chief executive election at 2017, no matter whether DAB will uh, nominate our own candidate, uh, because uh, certainly we will try to nominate our candidate at 2017, and so that we hope that we can uh, learn the experience from uh, the uh, upcoming national election. And uh, another thing about the super seat is that um, uh, we will try to uh, get the answer whether this super seat in action has any meaning to the universal suffrage uh, uh, about the logical election of the chief executive. Because now, as you know, uh, we, we have 30 seats from the functional constituencies. And uh, if we have universal service, it means that you must abolish the functional uh, functional asset, or you need to have a substantial reform of the functional set. And certainly, some people um, put forward a proposal that we may try to change the functional set uh, to super set in the 2016 logical election um, because if we uh, go in this direction it means that every voter in Hong Kong you will have two votes one vote for the geographical election another vote for the uh, super seat um, it may be an option for us okay, uh, for us to move uh, to the to the direction of Euro, uh, universal suffrage, and certainly we will try to see whether uh, this option can get the support from the people of Hong Kong. And um, also about the super is that um, I would uh, predict that actually the super seat election may favor to a, a two-party system in Hong Kong um, because uh, the super seat election it costs a lot uh, of resources, human resources, it costs a lot, a lot of money and it, the super seats also need this, uh, uh, the support of uh, the local power in Hong Kong. For example, uh, at the com uh, upcoming national election, if you want one in the super seat election, you must at least 
you, you need to get this uh, the nomination from 15 district council members. So for the smaller party, actually you cannot uh, even get the nomination. Even though you you, uh, you get the nomination, you still need to connect your inaction campaign to the geographical inaction. And I, I think that uh, it may not be easy for the smaller party to want the super seat. Uh, so if in the future we, we want to um, move to the direction uh, of super seat to replace the functional seats in Hong Kong, certainly I would say uh, it means that you agree that Hong Kong may go to the direction of a uh, two-party system rather than a multi-party system in Hong Kong. Certainly, uh, a two-party system has its uh, advantage to, to Hong Kong, but uh, some people may say that they oppose this uh, option because it means that you, you may gradually Im eliminate the smaller party in Hong Kong. So uh, I think uh, in the coming uh, four to five years, uh, it's a good time for us to, to see where, uh, whether you, you want to move to a two-party system or still maintain a, a multi-party system in Hong Kong. So, at, at the end, I would say that the super seat is a new element to our logical inaction. Um, we do not know how it happened. Uh, but uh, we will, uh, the, I'm sure that the, every party in Hong Kong will uh, learn a lesson from this super seat inaction. And uh, I, I, I hope that it can give a, a foundation for us to further discuss uh, about how to change our const uh, constitutional system in Hong Kong, uh, especially about the electrical uh, composition or the election system uh, in Hong Kong. Speaker, uh, I want to thank Eliza and Simon and Crystal and Stephen for their invitation here today. Um, in some ways, I can sympathize with uh, C.Y. Uh, I've been accused of being a non-party party member of the Civic Party, <laughs> but I am not a party member of the Civic Party or any other party in Hong Kong. I am a member of the Democratic Party. But it's the American Democrat. <laughs> and there is currently a Republican in Congress who says that anybody who is a member of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which I actually belong to and support, uh, is a communist. So it may be possible that I am a member of the Communist Party. <laughs> now, I don't mean to equivocate, it's just uh, there are different perspectives here. Um, I think, uh, in, in contrast to what uh, Anthony was saying, that I think that. Perhaps more than likely, um, the chief executive is going to be a bigger factor in the legislative council race than at any time since uh, 2004. And in 2004, the difference was that everybody was absolutely convinced that uh, Dong Chihua needed to leave. Um, everybody, including I think Dong Chihua at that point. Um, and, and this time, the situation is quite different. Uh, we have a, a chief executive who is coming in. Uh, who is going to have an unusually large effect because I think he is in a great hurry uh, to change things. Uh, I, I, he is already taking a number of populist moves. Uh, he is going to take further populist moves, that's almost for certain. Um, and that is going to have an impact uh, on the campaign and how he is addressed and how his initiatives are addressed and how they are perceived and interpreted uh, is going to be absolutely crucial uh, in the election. Um, also, one other thing that needs to be pointed out that we found in the district council election, um, survey research, and you'll notice this time I don't have uh, graphs and charts, uh, but what we did discover going through our data is that uh, even while the pro-democracy groups got their vote out, there were more votes uh, from other groups uh, that had not voted in the past, and we actually found that people who were born in mainland China are now more more likely to be registered to vote than people born in Hong Kong, which is a very big contrast with the way it's been before, 
Uh, we also found a new form of identity, which has uh, affected and changed people's behaviors. Uh, and what Horace was saying now about the division of FTU and DAV, uh, and with the Labor Party as well, uh, we're going to have some quite new currents uh, uh, in this election, and so I think uh, previous voting patterns uh, are not going to be the same, more than likely. Also, in terms of looking at the, the, some of the uh, uh, actions that, that Leng's take, Leng is uh, expected to take and already is beginning to take, I think one of the most important ones so far has to do with his ban on mainland mothers uh, giving birth in Hong Kong. Um, the way he started out doing it could be seen as, as arrogant and impatient and some disdain for procedures. Uh, certainly that's the way some of the civil service currently feel. Uh, but uh, depending on how he goes forward at this point, uh, he's going to, I think, uh, uh, influence uh, the way voters are going to vote, whether they're going to be voting for pro-establishment, which is going to be perceived as somewhat supporting uh, uh, Leung, or whether they're going to be uh, voting for the Democrats, and, which will be perceived as, as a, a way of, of uh, weakening Leung. Now, this is only partially true, again, because circumstances have, have changed. Uh, if he moves, for example, to amend the basic law, uh, putting out a, 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 a consultation process and so forth, uh, and involving uh, people in discussing that, uh, it's going to be very difficult to accuse him of not respecting the basic law. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to argue that uh, this is a move uh, that is trying to invite Beijing into Hong Kong politics and so forth. Uh, if he were, of course, to ask for an interpretation from the Standing Committee, then that's exactly what would happen. He would be accused of that, uh, and I don't think he's going to do that. It would be a dumb move, and one of the big differences between Leng and uh, Dong Chihua is that Leng is not dumb. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if he does this uh, purely administratively, uh, depending on how he does it, in terms of, for example, not, issu not issuing IDs uh, to children of, of mainland parents, um, that certainly is going to be challenged, I think, in court. And then, depending on whether Joseph can control the lawyers in his party, <laughs> <laughs> and if, if, the, if the lawyers take this case and they're related to the Civic Party, Civic Party is going to have the same disaster it had in the district council election this year. Um, so th that's going to be, and, and I've noticed already that Alan Neng is kind of acting preemptively to inoculate uh, public opinion on that by uh, jumping quite strongly into support of, uh, of, of, of stopping uh, mainland mothers from giving birth in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. Even uh, Lei Wing Tat uh, jumped in on that. So both the Democrats and Civic Party are trying to uh, separate themselves from the lawyers. Um, <laughs> So there's, there's a number of things that he could, he, he could do. Um, in, in any case, uh, I think it's going to be one of the crucial issues uh, in the election, uh, as some of the other populist moves that he, he, might, he might make. Uh, one of the key things I think that we need to, need to realize in terms of uh, what to expect from Xi uh, Leng and how the parties, what the parties are going to have to deal with, is we are, for the first time since the early 1990s, pre-1997, pre uh, entering a period in which Donald Jung does not have his hands around the economic throat of Hong Kong. He has been totally in control of the economic side of Hong Kong for a long time. And if you read Si Bai Leung's uh, platform, he was very bitter and extremely specific about his criticism, uh, effectively, of Donald Jung's economic management of the assets of Hong Kong uh, in terms of both the, the poor uh, as well as the nation of China. Uh, Donald Zhang was Director General of Trade, Chief Trade Negotiator back in 1991. He was Secretary of Treasury in 93. He was Financial Secretary in 95. Chief Secretary for Administration with, as Alan Lee put it, the persuadable Henry Tang uh, as the Financial Secretary. Uh, so he's, and then Chief Executive until now. So he's had an inordinately long uh, impact in that area. Uh, and, uh, and if you read uh, Si Wailang's article in uh, the Hong Kong Journal, uh, he was very, very explicit and detailed uh, about uh, his criticisms uh, of the way in which uh, uh, Donald Trump has run things, uh, including some points about upward mobility coming to a juddering halt, as he put it. Uh, uh, 
uh, effectively, for those with their own homes, the collapse of house prices compromised their only store of wealth. The immigration of low-skilled workers from the mainland has also affected the low-income groups. Data on sal salary development show that a million people, about 30% of Hong Kong's workforce, earned less in 2006 than they did in 1996. In the same decade, GDP per capita increased by 34%. Restaurant workers today earn 4% less than they did 17 years ago. Workers in fast food outlets earn 19% less. Those driving lorry containers earn 30% less. All right, so he is acutely aware, uh, and as was pointed out in the first panel, uh, it may be true that he's a socialist. I don't know about labels or whatever to, to put on people, but uh, certainly uh, uh, I think the uh, Lee Ka Sheng faction uh, regarded him as an enemy, and they are probably right. <laughs> uh, I think in this case, uh, with uh, Leung strongly expected uh, to take populist measures, uh, that it's going to be very difficult for, for, for parties to place themselves as more populist than thou, particularly regarding Leung. It's just going to be really tough. And at the same time, it's going to be tough to criticize him for taking populist moves. And especially if he argues very strongly for the urgency of taking those populist moves, and we begin to see various factions saying, hold it a minute, slow down, don't, you know, you're being too hasty. Uh, whenever people are desperate, and uh, some recent research that's being done by Civic Exchange uh, has pointed, has shown that, that, that women in their 60s, 70s, and 80s are, 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 are becoming criminals. They are, they are getting arrested and put in jail for petty theft more than they have in the past. These are people who are so desperate and so on the edge. They are so desperate. Old ladies stealing and, and going to jail for it. This is, this is an absolute shame on Hong Kong. And I think C.Y. Lang is, is aware of many of these things and feels it quite strongly. So it is possible that Lang could actually trap the pan-democrats with these populist moves uh, and make it very difficult for the traditional uh, pan-democrat uh, uh, approaches to work. It's very clear that the FTU is going to counter the, the Labour Party. Uh, and so I think we're going to see a quite strong move uh, towards more populist uh, issues, uh, whether or not the DAB puts itself in the middle or not, I'm not sure how you're going to do that, but I think the whole, the whole spectrum is going to move, <laughs> not that way, but to the left, not to the right, it's going to go to the left, all right? Um, so I think that's going to be particularly large. Uh, looking forward, uh, one of the unavoidable issues and what's going to be very interesting if the pan-democrats take advantage of this uh, is constitutional reform. Uh, by my calculation, using uh, Stephen Lamb's uh, speed, um, <laughs> which may be expected to speed up, uh, they always claimed that they needed at least a year prior to an election uh, to prepare for it. So if you start backing up from 2017 and then the legislative election of 2016 and the district council election of 2015, if you're right about that becoming part of the revised FCs, all right, it would have to include the district council elections. Uh, we're already getting a year prior to that puts us somewhere around the end of 2013, somewhere 2014, at the latest, okay, for him to act. Um, I think Lung is more than likely going to do populist uh, moves, build up public support, then go for constitutional reform. Uh, the only vulnerability he's got is to be accused of being in a hurry for economic things, but not in a hurry to be specific and do anything about uh, constitutional reform. Uh, he may argue that you know when people's house is on fire is not the time you start arguing about the shape of the bucket that you gather the water in, um, and say that that let's deal with the urgent stuff first and then deal with constitutional reform. But I'm not sure how well that's going to work. Uh, I think he may be pushed by this election uh, towards becoming a bit more uh, specific about some of the details. Uh, even though I think he's going to talk more about the process of consultation rather than about the details of the package he might want to put out. Uh, the key issue for the Democrats, I think, is in, in light of the fact that, uh, that 47 votes is what will be needed in the new Legislative Council uh, to pass a constitutional reform. Currently, the Democrats have more or less 23 seats. 
meaning that they're one seat short already of being able to form a blocking uh, veto. Uh, they would have to hold on to every single seat they have now, plus win at least one seat uh, out of either the five new GCs or the, or the five district councils of uh, uh, super seats. If um, some of the uh, famous people like Audrey uh, don't run again, Audrey you don't run again, then it's going to be really tough for them to hold on to their seats. Uh, the DAB got suckered last time, uh, it sounds like they learned a lesson uh, about making sure that, that their votes count. Uh, so, and also with the increased number of seats, that's also going to uh, throw off some of the preceding calculations. So I think some of the expectations about the Legislative Council and how the votes traditionally break down into seats uh, is not going to hold uh, again. In terms of the super seats, uh, what I was looking looking at, uh, and I, I wrote up a paper that some of you have, and I'll post the, 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 the his written remarks on the uh, hktp.org website uh, after this. Um, if, for example, the, the either side wins or loses all five of the super seats, either way, it will make using the super seats as a, as a way forward um, very doubtful. Okay, if the Democrats lose all five, they're not going to want to expand the super seat system. If the DABFTU loses all five, they're not going to want to do it. Uh, so the best thing is a, a split, a three-five split, uh, one way or the other. Um, and, and I think that uh, th there are some very interesting things that could be done out of the various types of election. Uh, Benny, yeah, Benny, yes. Uh, I, I agree with some of Benny's stuff and some of the stuff I've done independently about in terms of, of, of uh, um, uh, geographic seats, uh, functional type seats, identity type seats, uh, party list uh, elections. Uh, some of the better uh, political systems have a variety of ways of allowing people to, to represent themselves. Uh, we don't always uh, best represent ourselves just in, in our geographic accounts but also in terms of what we do uh, and in terms of our, our interest. So I think in this case, uh, one of the key things that's going to come out of this, no matter how many seats are won by the super seats, is that for the first time we're going to have a lot of people begin to pay attention to the functional constituency system, and they're going to finally begin to pay attention to the two-house rule where, the, where the, the directly elected GCs and the functional constituencies vote separately. Uh, many times uh, vetoing each other. Uh, for the first time, they're going to be asking, how is it possible that uh, a handful of people, elected by a handful of people, are able to veto the votes of the uh, people who have millions of uh, votes cast for them? Uh, and so I think that the traditional FC seats in their current format with small uh, franchises are going to be simply unviable going forward. I, I think that, that the populist pressure is going to be there, uh, and, I, and I think that, that, that these actions, uh, this, this will become uh, quite uh, apparent uh, after the election. Um, so, uh, in sum, effectively the, 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 the pan-democrats can be trapped by Leung. On the other hand, the de pan-democrats can trap uh, Leung and pro-establishment parties uh, if they're able, for example, to provoke the police into a crackdown, but they have to be very careful about that because if they, if they are seen as deliberately provoking, uh, if it's not a police overreaction, but uh, it's effectively demonstrators pushing things and pushing things until they finally get some sort of reaction, uh, then the public, and especially if it gets out of hand and, and destroys property around the sides, uh, the public in Hong Kong uh, tends to change their, their attitudes very, very quickly. Um, but if they're able to do that and try to get uh, them to appear as, as dictatorial, uh, then there is a possibility that they may, may be able to say that a vote for the DAB and the FTU is basically a vote to support Leng uh, and to support uh, democracy, uh, dictatorship. Um, but what I think in sum, uh, and Ray, this is building on, on, I wrote this before, Ray Yip um, made his comments. And, and I just want to read this last paragraph that I wrote uh, uh, several days ago. Uh, with the pan-democrats forming a block on one side, and anti-Leung tycoon-dominated FC seats and the Liberal Party on the other, Leung's LegCo support could be very narrow indeed. 
Uh, his own frustrations could then lead to the very kind of legical avoiding administrative actions that could be characterized as tantamount to dictatorship. There would be very little chance of constitutional reform before 2017 if this happened. But both then, pan-democrats and anti-lung tycoons would do their best to avoid blame for the reform failures. Uh, Lung could end up so unpopular and ineffective he becomes a one-term chief executive, handing over to another chief executive chosen by the current methods in 2017 to attempt the task of reform uh, for chief executive in 2020 and LegCo in 2024. Thus, those who oppose Lung could defeat him, but the cost would be yet another delay for democracy in Hong Kong. So I think that we all have quite a bit uh, at stake uh, in the next few months and, and the events over the next few months. Thank you. I'm the uh, only pro-democracy activist uh, among the panel speakers this morning, so I assume this role directly in a straightforward manner. Basically, we face a very tough situation. It is a matter of Hong Kong people defending their core values. It is a matter of Hong Kong people willing, ready to stand up and be counted. What we see in the previous CE election was very clear. When it was necessary, the central authorities would step in it would intervene in a very blatant manner. We all understand that the chief executive has to be someone trusted by Beijing, accepted by the business community. Most Hong Kong people are not prepared to do much about it. And when Beijing slightly panicked and felt that it had to intervene with somebody, with, with a Politburo member, Liu Yandong, sent from Beijing to Shenzhen. Again, most of us felt it was very interesting, very attractive drama, and we don't see much threat to our core values, to the one country, two systems model. This is the challenge. We have been talking about ah, cooking the floor, the lukewarm water all the time for many, many years. We don't seem to have the lessons learned. What are we going to do when Beijing decided who, who was going to be our chief executive about three weeks before the election date, and the machinery was mobilized, and, and if we are satisfied to, to have a very interesting drama, a very attractive drama, we face a serious threat to our core values. Many people now think it is fashionable to criticize the hegemony of the big businesses, the hegemony of the real estate groups. Again, what we saw was that when Henry Tang was seen to be totally unacceptable to be the chief executive by the Hong Kong people as reflected by opinion polls, yet almost all of our real estate tycoons openly nominated him for the next chief executive, in defiance of popular opinion, in defiance of the feelings of the values of the community. The result actually is that we see a watered down and a watered down version of the competition law, and there's not much we can do about it. Certainly, the pro-democracy political groups have not done their part in defense of Hong Kong people's interests. <clears throat> they are too busy with their infighting, they are too busy with uh, protecting their seats in Mexico, and so on. 
we are in a very challenging situation in that since 2003, Beijing is much more ready to step in. And it has established a very resourceful and a very sophisticated machinery to deliver services at a grassroots level and to win elections. Sometimes they do make mistakes. I mean, last time, if they acted better, they could have squeezed out Emily Lau and Audrey Yu from their seats. That would be very sensational international news. So, and at the same time, after the CE election, we are going to have a very sophisticated politician for the first time to be our chief executive. Uh, si Chong was a kind-hearted, incompetent businessman. <laughs> uh, Donald Zhang was a, well, is a, is a very arrogant civil servant who simply wanted to do, to do his job. Now we have a very ambitious and a very sophisticated <coughs> politician whose political wisdom is probably higher than most politicians in Hong Kong, including those in the full democracy camp. He is very well versed in United Front tactics and strategies, and he has a machinery ready to back him up. Yet, he is a rather weak chief executive, at least at this stage. Now, this weakness can be a very dangerous thing because this weakness may prompt him to use the influence of the Chinese authorities much more. Already, we see what happened. A department head of the centralized and office, Chou Ebo, summoned the head of the CE's office, Leung Chok Wai, and scolded him for the handling of the West Kowloon cultural project. It is very much like a party secretary scolding the provincial governor or a, a, or a, a bureau chief of a provincial government for not doing his job. And we have heard many, many stories that the centralization office has been asked by ministers by secretaries of even this government to help lobby to ensure passages of legis pieces of legislation through FETCHCO. If we have a weaker government, if we, if we have a weaker chief executive who cannot all the time maintain a safe majority support in the Legislative Council, centralized an office will step in and do the lobbying, the necessary lobbying job. So this, so this is the challenge we face today. So it's not a matter of something very interesting going to happen. It is a matter of, are you ready to stand up to defend your interests? Are you ready to stand up to defend your core values? I have heard statements uh, about uh, having to plan to emigrate again after the election of CE, I have heard this com communist, this common Cantonese statement, <laughs> after the election. So there, there is a certain sense of crisis. But uh, I do not see any ready action on the part of Hong Kong people yet. The pro-democracy camp certainly has very high hopes concerning the July 1st protest rally, and I certainly hope that there will be a lot of people, a lot of Hong Kong people coming out to march. We need to tell the Chinese authorities, we need to tell the chief executive 
that we are ready to defend the one country, two systems model, that we still value our core values, that we are ready to fight to defend these core values. My friend, uh, Professor de Golia, has certainly highlighted the danger of the appeal of populism because of the incompetence and the indecisiveness and the lack of political will on the part of the Sage Kong administration and the uh, Donald Trump administration, there is a lot of room for a weak chief executive to behave in a very popular manner and do things that can appeal for the support of a majority of Hong Kong people at this, for a short while. The handling of the pregnant mothers coming to Hong Kong is a very typical example. The promise of some money for Tin Sui Wai and so on is another example. The SAR government has ample fiscal reserves and if it chooses, it can spend the money wisely to make people happy for a little while. Uh, the basic question I would like to ask is, are we in a position to enlighten the public so that Hong Kong people are aware of the consequences? Well, the Civic Party certainly had its fingers very badly burnt by defending the Filipino uh, domestic servants' right to go through the judicial processes to defend their rights. And we see a lot of well-educated politicians exploiting this defense. I'm afraid we are going to see many, many more examples to come. And it is very much up to people in this room who are ready, who are willing to explain to their friends, to the people near them, what is the best long-term interest of Hong Kong people. The District Council elections, again, have been a very good example to demonstrate the tremendous power of the electoral machinery in the hands of the pro-Beijing front. And it reflects this sophistication, it reflects this long-term planning. So much so, it is very clear-cut that the pro-democracy groups, all of them together, cannot find three or four worthwhile, credible candidates to run for the five super seats. And even if we can manage to win three seats, we don't have, if I may say so, we don't have the kind of political figures that can make full use of the position to be to exercise effective political leadership. And this goes back to a very, to an extremely well executed campaign to defeat many of our potential candidates in the district council election. As a pro-democracy activist, I just want to make a final appeal. Please come out on July the 1st. <laughs> Please make sure you vote in September and get your friends to vote. It is a matter of doing our small part to defend our core values. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the speakers uh, for some very um, interesting and insightful analysis. Uh, now the time is open to the floor. Um, yes.
So, considering the uh, the recent CE election and the increased polarization of Hong Kong society, not just across the board, but also within the pro Beijing and the pan democratic camps themselves, how do you see the role of the post 80s and or possibly more radical uh, elements uh, occurring in the, in the future? Thank you. By the way, I'm sorry, I, I forgot one thing. Actually, uh, Professor Joseph Chang just mentioned to me before um, the session began that he has to run off to catch a flight. So if there are questions that are directed to him, you know, I think those questions uh, should go first. But uh, is, is your question directed to any particular speaker? Uh, I can wait for all the questions. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I, I just let's ask for to be allowed to respond first. Right, right. right. So, so let's collect all the questions that are directed to uh, Professor Chang first. Is there any question? Anybody would like to ask more questions? Yes. There's a lot of things which uh, Joseph said which are factual. Core values are changing. And uh, he also made a very good point about the new chief executive doing the things which the democratic camp has been asking for apart from the universal vote. The popular things, doing it better than they can do it themselves. And by doing that, he's going to get more votes on the ground. So, as you said, he would be leading the party. But it is very important, I agree with you, that our core values, we must build this up among our younger generation and those who are active and want Hong Kong to be sustainable for the future. It, and the question has to do with the what do we do to plan ahead on the functional constituencies I think that has a lot to do with the future so I'm going to leave it to that And uh, I would like to ask Professor uh, Zhang about uh, uh, what is his view, whether it's possible to have universal suffrage in 2017. Uh, because I found that, uh, as a former civil servant, I found that uh, uh, in addition to declining the core value of civil servants, there is a political cultural change uh, in the past years. And a CY leading style in the past uh, there's a lot of conflict in them for the middle class, middle rate, middle level civil servants. So, uh, what is your view on in that part? Okay. Uh, are there any questions that are, that are specifically for Professor Chen? Yeah. Um, as a young person, I just um, wonder how to um, make the best use of the uh, fundamental freedoms we still cherish, and um, particularly in the context of um, more Beijing interference in Hong Kong affairs, um, and how the best strategy which translates to um, the more demo democratization of the Hong Kong political system. Thank you. Uh, this could be direct to Professor Chen, but perhaps others as well. It seemed that in the although you've 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 talked about core values and then everyone's talked about the political environment changing. It seemed like the uh, pan-democratic camp was 
reasonably successful when you were working pretty closely together. I know the environments have changed and, and so on, but especially, uh, especially with it, with several issues, especially the the uh, perhaps less radical wing of the pan-democrats are not working together. Are there prospects for doing that? Because without without uh, a strategy and, and without uh, implementation, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to move forward. And I just wonder from your prospect, is the prospect of cooperating better with the Democratic Party and, and perhaps a few others? Uh, hello. Uh, I have, I have a, uh, just a very simple question. Uh, when we are talking about one country and two systems, it seems that uh, we are pursuing democratic uh, um, uh, issues uh, along the way, and it's more to the, uh, to the two systems. But how, how do we handle the one country, and uh, how do you put the two terms together, interpret it and operate uh, in Hong Kong? Um, just really for Professor Anthony Chung, just um, following up on what he was saying about the nomination process for 2017, you were saying, well, it was, if you keep the election committee and you transform it into a nominating committee, it's guaranteed, a, more or less guaranteed, a pro-democracy candidate uh, would be able to stand. But it's actually quite simple to stop that. And in fact, um, people like Eugene Open put it forward in the past. You can keep the existing nomination process, but just um, insist that um, the nominations are split between all four sectors of the committee. I mean, there are various ways of doing it. It would be very hard for Democrats ever to get enough nominations from the business sector. So I'm wondering whether you're perhaps a bit too optimistic there in assuming that even if you, you, you kept the existing committee, then Democrats would definitely be able to stand in 2017. Um, my question is um, to Professor Chang. Um, you talk about the long-term interests of Hong Kong people, and it appears that the two systems uh, is what you are defending. Um, but that is, even if you are successful, that is still a sh very short-term measure. Because what happened after 2047? I mean, the one country will definitely be the priority then. I guess we've collected quite a number of questions already, but maybe uh, Professor Chen would like to respond to all these questions. Yeah. Or some of them. One country, two systems first. There's a limit to what we can do to influence China. Basically, I accept unless there is genuine democracy in China, we are not going to get genuine democracy in Hong Kong. But at the same time, at least we have to make sure that we maintain and uphold our models. An obvious example will be corruption among our top officials, among our civil servants. If our chief executive, if one of our secretary for administration continue to behave like that and followed by other top civil servants, that would be very dangerous. When our top civil servants do not hesitate to appoint uh, the second generation, third generation family members of the tycoons into all kinds of important advisory committees, that is a form of corruption. There's a limit to what we can do to influence China. But the first thing we should do is we must avoid absorbing the bad practices of China. We must work hard to set a model for China and hope for the best. This is the least we can do. When I say core values, it requires 
a basic self-reflection on our part. When we say we would like to uphold the rule of law because the rule of law is important for us, we have to understand perfectly what it means. In the decade after, 18, after 1989, a lot of our friends tried to, to emigrate. Most of them cheated a little. Some of them also tried it very hard to have their babies born in the United States and other Western countries. We all had a lot of sympathy for these friends. Some of us tried to learn each other's tricks of doing that smoothly. But when it comes to a matter of uh, Chinese pregnant women coming to Hong Kong, our simple response is stop them from coming. Uh, despite the fact that our chief executive tried to develop our medical services as, uh, as one of the six strategic industries. And if some of the, if increasingly a lot of the rich tycoons in China want to make use of our eye specialists, heart specialists, this, a similar effect will also occur in Hong Kong. This is what I mean by core values, by having a more long-term view concerning the upholding of our core values, of our rule of law, and so on. It also pays for us to stand up to do something, to make our voices heard. If we are unhappy with some of the newspapers, at least show our preferences by the, by the newspapers we read every day. If you criticize certain newspapers and you still allow them to be the most popular, best-selling newspapers in Hong Kong, there's not, there's not much we can do. But every one of us has a basic choice. You choose the newspapers to read. You choose the news, the news programs uh, to enjoy. All that I'm saying is that we, we, we should do a little bit more than just being a commentator, uh, be say, uh, just saying that oh, the, the present times are interesting, we are very interesting years ahead, and so on. It is a matter of everyone trying to do something positive, constructive, to make sure that we uphold and maintain our values, and to make sure that the things we cherish about Hong Kong will stay. This calls for efforts on the part of everyone. And unless everyone does his part, we are not going to face our challenges ahead very well. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll let the other speakers respond to um, the questions. First of all, um, uh, over the last 30 years, uh, since I've started uh, getting involved in politics, I've always tried to look at half a glass of water as half full, not half empty. So despite what uh, Joseph has said very eloquently about core values, but I think let's, for a moment, don't assume that individuals in our society they are not in their own different ways, small ways, defending their own freedom, their own core values. I think, uh, given my background as someone who have come from the pro-democracy camp, sometimes I think the Democrats have to really reflect as to whether sometimes they have become too arrogant to the extent that only their way is the democratic way. Um, now, talking about C election 2017, I try to be optimistic. Of course, there are different ways of preventing Democrats from fielding the candidate. Um, but I think, at the end of the day, we have to ask, I think in Hong Kong, we know why we need uh, the election of a chief executive by universal suffrage. I think Beijing has to ask the question, why? If Beijing doesn't want to have universal suffrage, there's, there are many ways of stopping it. I mean, well, no consensus. 
in Hong Kong, so let's stop there. So we have to ask, uh, or Beijing has to ask, why to pin down this timetable if Beijing is not uh, instrumentally serious about it, in respect of the motivation. So my point is, if 2017, the election, is such that despite, at the end of the day, you have the popular vote, but in the nomination, you just prevent the Democrats from having the opportunity to fill a candidate. Bearing in mind, the Democrats are not representing a minority. They are representing, well, if you like, half of the population, I said. So half the population um, is not going to have the opportunity to fill a candidate. I think that would be a disgrace. And I think it doesn't do the election, the credibility of the election any good. So my political definition of what is a general election is not just the, the, the nomination procedure. I mean, Singapore has parliamentary election. But then there are people who say, well, in Singapore, you have illiberal democracy. So my point is politically defined. A democracy in the case of Hong Kong is a democracy where the opposition, and the opposition in Hong Kong, the main opposition, refers to the pre-democrats. They can feel a candidate. Now, I think in all three people's eyes, that, that means a choice. <laughs> whether at the end of the day, when they cast the vote, whether they will cast the vote for the pro-democracy candidate, I don't know. I doubt. <laughs> I'm not too optimistic. Um, the worst case scenario for Beijing is the Democrats find a good reason to boycott the election. Then the election totally will be discredited. I don't think that will be uh, to the favor of Beijing. Of course, Beijing has to balance the risk. <laughs> we all know uh, Beijing will be very suspicious of the pan Democrats. But I think that, that there is still a time where we can thresh out these issues. Um, one country, two system. I think uh, the, the way we look at one country, two systems today is very different from when the idea was mooted in the 1980s. Because at that time, I suppose both on, in Hong Kong and on the part of the mainland, we were anticipating separation of the two systems. No crossing the border. But now, at least economically and socially, the border, we don't call it the border today, because the boundary, the boundary is becoming more um, blurred. We are more talking about cross-boundary, which is normal. The worst we would like to see is for China or the mainland to close the doors. This is not good for, for the mainland's development. So we are talking about one country, two system in a very different context, a context of growing economic and social integration. Now, that would certainly bring a lot of implications on Hong Kong and on the mainland. Uh, when the basic law was finalized in 1990, I think nobody would expect that there would be mainland uh, mothers giving birth in Hong Kong. That basically would not be possible. <coughs> there was the border. There, there wasn't this uh, individual visiting scheme. You, you, I mean, mainland people, if they could not buy property in Hong Kong, now they can. So I, I think we are in a rather different ballgame. So I think, first of all, in terms of interpretation, we really have to look at it. But at the end of the day, one country systems also be redefined, in my personal view. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, that formula was meant to be a self-preservation formula, both for Hong Kong and for the mainland. For Hong Kong, we want to protect whatever we have in Hong Kong. For the mainland, they don't want to be polluted by Hong Kong, but it's a different system. But now, it's more complicated. Into the future, if we just mechanically we, uh, consider this as a formula just to uh, respect what was in history, in the past, then we are not really preparing ourselves for the future. Then 2014, uh, 47 will become another uh, use by date, <laughs> just like what 1997 was before that. So I think if we try to be looking into the future, let's look at China as a whole. I've always put this question to our friends on, on the mainland. I said, when you say that I did ultimately you want to be the mainland, would like to be reunited with Taiwan, what would be the kind of China by then? It would be very different from the relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland. 
So I put forward another way of looking at one country to system to them. And so ultimately, in my view, the, the, the better picture would be two systems, one country. In other words, we will be talking about China, which is so diverse. So there are different systems, and then these different systems, they represent different images of our country. And this is the China that is diverse, pluralistic, respecting local traditions, hopefully freedom, everything. I think this should be what we should be fighting for. We are not fighting for uniformity. We should be fighting for diversity. of the questions are just to Professor Chen and Professor Chen. <laughs> yeah, but I, I get one question about the uh, after 80s and after 90s. Um, um, actually, I have um, much experience to deal with the, the young people in Hong Kong because uh, actually I, I came from the youth wing, uh, young DAB. I'm the ch I was, I'm now retired, I was the chairman of the young DAB. <laughs> um, in my view, uh, yeah, uh, it's why that there's some young people, they are, uh, uh, I guess, relatively radical, but they are still minority in terms of number because uh, actually now I still know um, many, many, after the 80s, after the 90s, they are very rational. You can communicate with. Um, but for the more radical young people, when they read the Apple Daily every day, when they listen to the speech of the LSD every day, actually it's very difficult for a DAB member like me uh, to, to communicate with them. Uh, actually, they would not try to communicate and understand the views of the, other, uh, of the parties other than LSD and the people power. Uh, even in my experience, even the Democratic Party, they still have a difficulty to communicate with these minority, these uh, radical young people. But uh, to me, I will, uh, I will uh, use my time to communicate, uh, to communicate with the majority young people. They are actually still very uh, rational. Um, and I hope that um, uh, uh, I can certainly uh, share my view about uh, Davis view about how to uh, move uh, uh, forward with the rational young people in Hong Kong, which uh, and they are the majority in uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, I've got a report on the post 80s on our website, and um, also some of our more recent work hasn't been published yet. Uh, shows, for example, that. Uh, if you were in the 1990s, if you were a woman in your 50s, you were the more typical of the unemployed person. Uh, in the first half of uh, 2000, 2005, uh, there was no difference between age groups and gender. Uh, but in the latter half of, of 2006 to 2010, um, you were more likely to be a younger male, uh, somewhat less educated, but, but a younger male. Uh, and I think this is why we've also seen some of this radicalization uh, in terms of unemployment and, and lack of opportunities. Um, we also find that, that uh, uh, younger women who are better educated uh, have not been moving into the professions as much as, as they should be, uh, as you would expect uh, statistically. Uh, they're, they're stuck in, in blue-collar jobs, and uh, clerical jobs, and service jobs, uh, and this is a frustration to them. So some of this is coming out of that lack of, of social mobility that, that, that C.Y. Lam is talking about. Uh, in some ways, his populism is going to go directly to that. So in terms of changing the tone and nature of political elections, uh, yes, you may have radical actions, but at the same time, I think his actions on populism and to address these kinds of issues is, is also going to affect that. Okay. Uh, but certainly, you're, you're correct if this is a social issue. In dealing with uh, Hong Kong people's willingness to defend their core values, uh, which, which uh, Joseph was, was giving this very mournful description of it. Uh, I, I just have to go by observation um, and, and watching Hong Kong people for many years. When you have close to a quarter of a million Hong Kong people come out to vote in an, an election that, that Robert Chung put together, yeah, to vote in an election which is not an election, uh, and they stand in long lines, and over half of them put a blank 
piece of paper in the box. In other words, they, they took their weekend, they stood in lines, and they basically achieved nothing, and they put something with nothing on it in a box. And almost a quarter million people did that. They did it just to make a point. And believe me, anybody who didn't get the point would have to be blind, deaf, dumb, and related to Dumb Chiba. <laughs> really, really, Hong Kong people will defend their core values. And actually, I, I say this with shame as an American, I would take randomly a million Hong Kongers off the street to a million Hong Kong uh, Americans off the street uh, and uh, choose them as my core for defending freedom uh, any day of any week you wish to name. I think Hong Kong people stand up for their freedoms and they are very vocal about it and they make their point and they will demonstrate and they do it a lot better than the Americans who talk all the time about freedom but seemingly have no concept of what it really is. <laughs>
writing about uh, integration uh, in newspapers, so maybe I'll, I'll give some uh, uh, views on this. I think it's but natural that uh, Hong Kong is integrating with the mainland. I think this is a, a two-way process. And um, um, there are things that uh, happened at the civil society level that government has no role to play. I mean, for example, this recent uh, controversy about uh, a company using simplifying characters. I learned simplifying characters when I was a, a, a secondary student. I'm talking about 40 years ago. Basically because I had a need. I need to read books published on the mainland. So, so I think the use of uh, characters, language, should not be politicized uh, too quickly. I mean, when Hong Kong had good business uh, from Japanese tourists, well, some, some companies, they, they put up Japanese signs. So I think let's be more relaxed. But of course, the fact that we are not relaxed, that indicates a problem. This sense of uncertainty, crisis about the Hong Kong identity. So the Cantonese will be regarded as what is Hong Kong. And then the complex characters represents Hong Kong. So there is a more in-depth issue that we need to address. And I think at the moment this uh, social and economic integration probably has um, driven some of us in Hong Kong to face the problem, to face the issue. Uh, I think certainly we need to ensure that there is everything to gain economically from integration, but then whether or not the gain is spread evenly, whether those who are suffering from integration, they're, they're not the same as those who are benefiting from integration. And, and if the market cannot achieve that more sort of even distribution of the benefits or sharing of the, the pain, then I think this is where government has to step in. This is where government policies might perhaps have a role to play. I mean, it's like uh, uh, meaningless buying property in Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong is an open market. We should not discriminate anyone. But on the other hand, if the locals cannot find property that they could afford or the rental is going up so high, then surely there's a need for government to step in. Government cannot say, well, this is free market. Uh, you perish. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, 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 you profit for it. The same with pregnant women from the mainland coming to Hong Kong. Of course, we cannot allow, uh, uh, prevent any private hospitals from accepting anyone on business farms. But then the government has to decide whether, okay, should we watch, uh, keep closer watch over our boundary? Should we allow many mothers to come into Hong Kong? So certainly, in that respect, the government has a responsibility. The government cannot just say, well, you can't admit anyone. I mean, that, that, that is an entirely totally different issue. But the government cannot turn a blind eye. We cannot just say, well, this is core value. We accept anyone. You can't do it. This is politics. This is government responsibility. Hi. I've got a little question here. OK. Uh, directing this uh, question to Professor Zhang. Like uh, earlier on, you mentioned that like the uh, the boundary or maybe the border uh, with Hong Kong and mainland is getting blurry. Okay, and I do admit that. And after fifteen years of returning to uh, mainland China, uh, I think things are getting a bit blurry. Say that like the one country. When we talk about one country, what do we mean? And we try to uh, when we try to defend two systems, what are we trying to defend? So when like what the context that we have. Okay, what do we mean by you know uh, one country, two systems? Is that something that we have to redefine? And if that's the way, that how should we re redefine that? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I don't want to dominate the, the, the response, but let me respond first, because you refer to what I've been saying. I think um, in the 1990s, when the people in Hong Kong, by and large, accepted one country, two systems as a formula. Basically, it was a compromise. It was one way to protect Hong Kong because there's so much worry, fear about the mainland taking over Hong Kong. Um, but then as we move into the post-97 period, in other words, we are coming back to a normal period, then we really have to reflect on what we mean by two systems. If we say there are two systems, then theoretically there must be something distinct between the two systems. 
the history, the traditions, sometimes the institutions, the legal system, the, the, the values, things, things like that. But on the other hand, let's not just think from the Hong Kong perspective. On the mainland, I remember in the 1980s when the mainland was just beginning to open up, at one point there was this uh, saying on the mainland, Hong Kong Cantonese is the economic language. So anyone on the mainland, if they want to go into business, learn Cantonese. I mean, well, Hong Kong, the, the Cantonese at that time was a, a language was a very strong language economically. I mean, so in a way, sometimes things change because of the changing circumstances, the economics. So, but of course, uh, I think any system has its own instinct to preserve, to protect whatever it values. So I think it's natural that there will be tensions. But the important thing is whether the tensions have become too vicious or whether tensions are constructive tensions. And secondly, when we talk about one country, uh, probably in the 1980s, one country simply referred to sovereignty. Okay, so Hong Kong coming back to the PRC. But into the future, now that we are reunified, what do we mean by one country? Do people on both sides of the boundary in Hong Kong and the Romania, do they share some common destiny, some common commonalities? If we don't have that commonalities, I mean, that one country is rather superficial. It's entirely sort of a legal, legalistic one, the fact that we are part of PLC. But I think, I mean, 15 years after reunification, probably is a time, is an opportune time for both sides, both the people on both sides, to really reflect on do we have anything in common? If we do have something in common, are we sort of trying to pursue that common goal, some common vision? Maybe on the mainland, they're saying, well, they want to modernize. They also want to have their own way of democratization in Hong Kong. So I think they, uh, I'm not saying that uh, we are so similar, because there are certainly areas of distinction. But I think to uh, face the, 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 the issue, we cannot just look at ourselves. And not in the same way, the mainland cannot just look at ourselves. But I believe that uh, gradually people will try to look at things in a more sophisticated manner. I remember in the 1980s, uh, 1990s, when Taiwan became the first strong economy, people in Hong Kong, they, they blame the Taiwanese <laughs> because a lot of Taiwanese coming to Hong Kong. So, so history repeats itself. So I think probably uh, by some stage, may, maybe the so-called main and big spenders, they will pass that initial stage of, sort of uh, the sort of new rich, and they will became, become more effective. Of what's happening. Follow up on that. Um, many of the problems of, of Hong Kong mainland relations are, are, are based on uh, actually shared values, uh, and uh, for example, uh, a lot of mainland folks come here to buy products, okay, that they know are genuine because Hong Kong has a good regulatory environment. Our government works. Our government does what needs to be done in terms of piracy and protecting copyright and various other things. Um, and so people come here to get the genuine product. Okay, now these are actually consumers wanting to make sure that their money is spent well. Isn't that a core Hong Kong value? Uh, isn't that exactly what the folks across the mainland are, are, are trying to do here? Uh, the problem is our market's too small. I mean, there's just too many of them and too few of us, okay? And they've got too much more money than, than we can actually handle, which is really kind of a stunning thing to think of in terms of Hong Kongers. Um, but it's the same thing in terms of our property. Uh, again, they want to come here because our property rights are better protected. Now, effectively, if you analyze the situation, it shows that what we have are a series of regulatory reforms that are badly needed on the mainland. Uh, they also need to have a fully convertible currency uh, and be able to take their money elsewhere and spend their money elsewhere rather than just Hong Kong because that's the only choice they got. They got two choices. Come to Hong Kong, buy milk powder, buy property, buy Louis Vuitton shopping bags, stop on the way home, go to Macau, blow up whatever money's left, and then they get to go home. All right. Uh, but this is very, very Hong Kong-like. Okay. So I think in many ways it is. Uh, it, you know, it's a lot more one country than people realize in many ways. It, we just have, we just currently have a better government, okay? And I think they want a better government, and they're demanding a better government, and they're pushing for a better government, and this is the, the case in, in Guangdong province. 
Uh, and I think ultimately they're going to get a better government. Okay, and especially whenever their money becomes fully convertible, they'll be able to vote with their dollars. And trust me, that's going to have an impact. You know, we run into a situation where they are gaining in some way and they are losing in some way. That we are somehow eventually getting into. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think there's a disequilibrium is exactly the, the point. And, and I think right at the moment, because of, of, the, of China's, the way it's moving into the WTO and into the global economy, and it's expanded so fast. And, you know, we've never had a situation in which the world's second largest economy had a non-convertible currency. Okay, and they're already taking moves on that. Okay, this is, this is a, a global phenomenon. I speak as a political economist, okay? This is a global phenomenon we've never seen before. Uh, and it's not being handled very well. And Hong Kong, as the uh, at right on the interface of 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 the the international trading system, free market, currency, all this stuff, we're we're getting both the value of that and the brunt of the weight of that. Okay, we're bearing it, and it's 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 like it's like a huge elephant standing on a needle. Okay, and we're on we're underneath that needle. Okay, we're really feeling it, but. They're going to be getting off that needle. They're already beginning to move, widening the band, various other technical moves. You know, they know that they must move. They know that they must reform. They can't have baby milk powder killing off their children. They know this. All right. They're desperate to do something about this. Uh, and the weird thing is, I think they look to Hong Kong a lot for, for assistance. If you look at their regulatory framework, they draw a lot from us. Uh, I think they were actually shocked uh, with, the, with the corruption that appeared recently in Hong Kong. They, they think we have a clean government. We thought we had a clean government, you know, and we need a clean government, uh, okay. And I think we're going to get one because just like the mainland Chinese, we're not going to put up with anything less. Okay. Um, sorry, I need to stop this, although I think the discussion is starting to get very interesting, but we do need to uh, end this conference soon and return to the venue. Uh, for a class that will start at 2 p.m. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you again uh, to all the distinguished speakers uh, from both the first section and uh, this section uh, for their valuable time and also to offer their um, very insightful analysis to um, uh, some of the political issues that are really important uh, for Hong Kong's political development. Uh, I'm not going to repeat those points one by one, but I think you know both you know the analysis of the C election and the legislative council elections have covered you know various points uh, ranging from uh, the um, development in the pro-establishment camp uh, to um, the uh, the situation of the pan democrats um, as well as a Hong Kong civil society development. Um, how our you know. Um, the next uh, chief executive, uh, C.Y. Lerm, his policy will actually have a spillover effect on Hong Kong's political development. And I think, uh, you know, we also benefit from uh, a lot of excellent questions from the floor. Um, amazingly, I think uh, the, the questions from the floor actually uh, brought us, uh, brought the discussion to, uh, to uh, the discussion of a very fundamental issue of one country, two systems. Um, as, you know, there are the more pessimistic view, of course, about you know how Hong Kong's core value will be, you know, threatened by China's, uh, you know, increasing influence uh, on Hong Kong. But at the same time, it seems that there are more optimistic view, um, you know, about you know the future of the integration between the two systems. And uh, one thing maybe we should not forget is uh, while you know China is increasingly. China is increasingly um, intervening in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's political development will definitely uh, influence China's future uh, political development. Um, so um, just one final note, and I think we should also uh, vote a thank to uh, all the staff members who are working very hard here today uh, to, sorry, we don't have the name, but for uh, uh, great success. So uh, I'm sure you're all thinking about lunch now, so let's bring this conference to a close and uh, wish everybody a nice weekend. Thank you.